Okay, go ahead. I'm waiting for the, the signal and announcement that is recording. Okay, it's recording now. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Welcome to the AJAR Academic Job Application Review Seminar Series that uh, is run by the uh, by the uh, Student Service Committee at uh, of AWSP. And as you know, this seminar series is uh, thought to celebrate the diversity that we have in our community and promote inclusion. And we are doing this uh, through uh, a series of, of seminar presentations by outstanding graduate students and postdoctoral researchers in our community. We are, today we have two excellent, uh, two excellent presenters and we are still making decisions and every two weeks we'll meet again and we'll have at this. Uh, we are also doing mock interviews with a, a small, like a phone interview and a more uh, serious complete interview with a senior researcher. And that's so to help promote this, uh, these amazing students and postdocs. So with that, uh, before I forget, remember that after the presentations, we'll have 15 minutes of uh, very informal networking. If you want to stay, please do. And if you have questions you can, uh, about the talks, you can write them on the chat, or even better, you can unmute yourself, introduce you, yourself, and ask that question. And with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And that's Dr. Uh, Jalin Lee. And as uh, she, she's going to be talk, uh, talking about advice, advancing, sorry, the sustainability of engineer systems through experimentation and quantitative sustainable design. She's coming, uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she did her PhD at the Colorado School of Mines and her master's also at the University of Illinois at, of Urbana-Champaign. She has an incredible record, uh, um, very, uh, um, very good number of publications, important publications, and she has worked in experimental work on resource recovery from wastewater, but also in QSD. So her talk will be very interesting for all of us. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today, and I'm looking forward to listening to your presentation. Thanks. Um, so thanks. <laughs> All right, is that good? All right, so thanks for the kind of introduction. Um, I'd like to start by firstly thanking the AWESP Ajar Committee for organizing this webinar series and also inviting me to give a presentation and also um, everyone here who is attending this webinar. So thanks for our attention. So today I'd like to talk about how I plan to advance the sustainability of our engineered research, so that is the experimentation and quantitative sustainable design or QSD. So the cover picture you are looking at uh, here right now is uh, one piece that I wrote summarizing my PhD work. And it highlights one kind of systems that we can really do a better job um, improving its sustainability. And that is the wastewater treatment systems. Um, so in today's presentation, I will start with the experimentation part um, using the wastewater treatment systems as an example. And then I will move on to explain what the QSD quantity of sustainable design is and uh, how I'm developing the tools um, to, to enable its execution. And finally, I will, I will use an example of the biorefinery design to show how the two themes of my research can come together for sustainability. All right, so let's start with the experimentation part. Um, so I said at the beginning of my presentation that we can build more sustainable wastewater treatment systems. Um, so why? So consider we are having one cubic meters of our typical domestic wastewater. Um, so the contaminants you will be expecting the, in this wastewater um, are maybe a couple hundred mi um, milligrams per liter of organics as COD, and then 30, 40 milligrams per liter of nitrogen in the organics, as well as in the form of ammonium, and also um, several milligrams per liter of phosphorus. So what we, are doing, what we are doing right now in our treatment is we are using the high footprint um, and the intensive aerobic process which uses about 0.6 kilowatt, um, uh, kilowatt hours of energy to treat those contaminants. And uh, you may ha have heard of some statistics um, that the wastewater treatment plants altogether account for around three to 4% of US electrical demand. And uh, for these wastewater treatment plants, 
around 30% of the operating and maintenance expenses, as well as 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from this need for electricity. Um, so this is really not a sustainable way to deal with the wastewater. So alternatively, if we put on another lens and then look at these contaminants as some sort of potential resources, then what we are looking at is the organics in those wastewater. Um, if we convert based on their electric, uh, electric potential, it's about two kilowatt hours of energy. So that is way more than um, the one we need for the aerobic treatment. And also, don't forget those natural and phosphorus in these wastewaters. Um, so if we can extract them and convert them to fertilizer, so those can save us around 0.8 kilowatt hours of energy, because right now we are using a very energy intensive um, Harbor Bosch process for natural fixation. So this means like with some um, better systems and technologies, um, we can make something valuable of all of those poops from our systems. Um, so how can we do that? I'm sure that many of you have your filter rods in um, extracting the energy and nutrients from wastewater. But my most, uh, the ones that I'm mostly interested in um, involve this um, use of biomass as an intermediate. Um, so the idea is that we can, uh, those um, dilute energy and nutrients as contaminants in the wastewater are actually pretty good food for the um, biomass. And those biomass, they can eat up those contaminants and accumulate them as the cellular compound in themselves. So here I'm showing a couple of pictures of different types of biomass I worked with in my um, dissertation work. So on the top there are two kind of algae. So it's Junalila uh, on the left and uh, a mixed culture of Corolina and the Spirulina on the right. And on the bottom it's some um, PHB or polyhydroxybutyrate producing bacteria. Um, so I actually worked with a uh, uh, even dirtier biomass, but considering this is lunchtime and for the best interest of everyone, so I chose not to put them here. Um, so that's the biomass I worked with. The next is we can use a series of different conversion, converting and upgrading technology to convert those uh, biomass into the fuels, chemicals, fertilizers, so valuable things that we can use. And here are just a couple of pictures um, of different types of reactors that I work with. So ranging from those like a, um, a couple of mills um, reactors, very, very, hand, uh, very fancy high-end um, computer uh, controlled continuous flow reactors, which I fondly named as Bubble B. Um, so this whole idea of um, treating this with water by producing some survival, um, so it sounds really nice. Um, but then the question is, are these systems really feasible? So well, um, they actually are. So firstly, I'm using the biomass for wastewater treatment. So in one of my papers, so we look at a pilot scale um, system for treatment of, of the primary municipal wastewater. And you can see from this um, part here that, so after this treatment, uh, we can successfully reduce the content of the BOD to the standard. And in other projects conducted by our Or industrial, um, which is, um, I'm sorry, I'm, ha uh, I'm sorry, I'm having some problem with my audio. Can anyone still, everyone still hear me? Yes, we lost you for like a couple of seconds, but now you are back. All right, um, is that good now? Yes, I think so. Yes. Should okay, I apologize for this. It's just the um, I lost the Bluetooth somehow, and my AirPods is not working. Um, so all right. Um, so in some other pro uh, projects, so our industrial partner show that their ecosystems can reduce the phosphor content of the secondary wastewater to almost zero. So this is, will be very expensive to achieve if using other um, rocks like the chemical precipitation. So this means, okay, we can use this biomass to treat it with water. And then the second step is to convert those biomass into viable products. Um, so in one of my papers, um, so we look at um, one integrated systems for the conversion of algae to valuable products. So we start this process by one technology called hydrothermal liquefaction or HTL. So HTL is a set of reactions that happen in hot compressed water. So we're talking about um, around 300 degrees C of temperature and then a couple of megapass for the pressure. So under those conditions, the water has some unique properties. It becomes slightly acidic. Um, so it can act as, as an acid catalysis. And it also um, has a higher solubilities for the organics in the biomass. So both of these prop uh, properties 
will accelerate the decompositions of those organics in water. So after this reaction, the typical uh, the main products we get are the HTL bio crude, which has most of the energies in the uh, most of the chemical energies in the algae, and we also have the um, aqueous stream, which has a lot of the organics and the, most of the nitrogens. And then we will have the biochar solid in um, uh, after the HTL reaction, which has almost all of the phosphorus. So next, what I use is the um, hy uh, catalytic hydro treating, which upgrades the bio crude we get into bio oil. And this with some further polishing can be used as transportation fuels, such as the diesel and the gasoline. And at the same time, we have some fuel gas, which can be used as a substitute for the natural gas. Um, and we also have the HTL, for the HTL aqueous streams, I use the catalytic um, hydrothermal gasification, which will convert more than 95% uh, of the organics in the aqueous stream um, into fuel gas. So again, um, can be used as a substitute for the natural gas, as well as producing a concentrated stream with the nitrogen in the form of ammonia. And then we can get those nitrogen resources out um, using technologies such as electrochemical stripping um, to, convert, um, to convert the ammonium to ammonia sulfate, and that can be used as uh, nitrogen fertilizers. So finally, for the HTL biochar solid, which has almost all of the phosphorus in the, bio, uh, in the biomass, we can um, use acid to get those phosphorus out and combine that with a portion of the HTL aqueous stream to form stewed. So this is a slow fertilizer for uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, as well as magnesium. So after all of this, what we can get is around 70% of the chemical energies all to, um, from the algaes in the form of the um, bio oil and fuel gas, and also 40% of nitrogen, 90% of the phosphorus. Um, so this is one way, one integrated, one integrated system um, that is possible for the biomass conversion. Um, so we can also have a look at other um, types of biomass and systems. Um, for example, for the PHB producing um, bacteria we are looking at, um, you may heard of this uh, PHB polyhydroxybutyrate as a kind of biopolymer, but the challenge associated with the wastewater derived PHB producing bacteria is that because of the complex uh, uh, matrix of the wastewater, um, so the PHB we get, we need to spend um, a lot of um, energies to get those PHB out um, and then purify that to the um, requirements of um, so that it can be used as a packaging material, for example, for, uh, for our food. Um, so instead of doing that, so what we propose here is that we can use the hydrothermal conversion and then convert the PHB to propylene. And because propylene is a gas, they can be easily separated from the dirty waste water matrix. And then for the rest of the um, non-PHP cellular materials of the biomass, we can just uh, convert, um, convert it to the bio crude and other products like I just talked about for the algae system. So this is another way that we can deal with the um, conversion of the biomass. So we have different options here. Um, so with all of these um, systems and technologies I'm developing, um, I feel the need of, um, uh, of some system of design analysis. So because I'm, I'm facing some questions that cannot be solely addressed by the experimentations. For example, um, so we have some um, goal in the future and now we are at some baseline um, and we have technologies that uh, represent some state of the art. Um, we really want to know that right now, so where are we in this process to the really like our ultimate goal of the sustainable wastewater treatment systems. And I talk about the two different kinds of um, systems biomass we can use um, for resource recovery from wastewater. Um, so which way should we go? And then finally, um, for these systems, when we are looking at their sustainability, we should consider um, different dimensions of sustainability. So there are trade-offs between the economic environment um, and health aspects. And we also want to get the feedbacks from our stakeholders. Um, so those farmers, do they want to use the wastewater derived fertilizers? So for the consumers, um, do they want to use some viable products um, generated from wastewater? So all these questions um, we want to answer, but we really can't answer that by just doing the experiments. So now to answer these questions, 
I need to put on my head of the QSD quantity of sustainable design and talk about uh, my current research. Um, so QSD, um, it is a structured methodology to guide the research, development, and deployment of technologies and inform informs uh, decision making. So there are three key components to define system, establish algorithms, and characterize sustainability. So let's go um, through them one by one. So firstly, um, for the definition for defining the systems, it refers to the need to draw the boundary for the system, basically state the processes, unit operations, inputs and outputs of the systems. Um, for example, if we want to consider a biorefinery, oh, sorry, if we want to consider um, uh, some biofuel, look at their sustainability. Um, so for these biofuels, we will um, have different parts um, in their value chain. So on the most upstream, um, we will have these farmers in the field so growing, harvesting these feedstocks. We will have those um, logistic systems transporting this biomass, and we will have this biorefinery um, converting these um, feedstocks into the bioenergy biofuels. So let's say we want to just focus on the biorefinery. Then we draw the boundary line at the biorefinery fence. So we consider anything and everything within that biorefinery. And next, um, is we want to specify our decision variables. So these are the things that we can control. Uh, for example, a farmer can control what kind of crops he, um, like they want to grow. And the way we can control the flow rates of the, our systems. Um, we can choose the membranes we want to use for some desalin uh, desalination systems, for example. And then we specify the technology parameters. So these are the parameters that define the performance of systems. So for farmers, it can be the yield of crops. Um, for some um, uh, chemical engineers, it can be the reaction conversions, et cetera. And then finally, we have the contextual parameters. So that are the non-technology parameters that influence the sustainability of systems. It can be the location of their systems. It can be the local tax rates, regulations, impacts, cost of their materials, so et cetera. So with these three different kinds of QSD inputs, so now what we have is the space of this system where your system can freely move about and we want to look at their, uh, its sustainability. So this is one key difference between the um, QSD approach and more traditional approach. So right now um, is that instead of just looking at one point within that space, we want to enumerate this whole space. Right, so that's one key part of the QSD. And in order for, uh, in order for us to do that, um, what we need to do is to establish the design and the process algorithms. So these are just the equations that have helped us to automate the simulation of the system within that space. So for example, for the design algorithms, um, in my most recent publications, so we are looking at designing a biorefinery. And in that biorefinery, we have a hydrolysis reactor. So to design this reactor, um, we have three key components, reactor tank, agitator, and heat exchanger. So let's take the um, reactor tank. To design this, we need to look at the dimensions, materials, numbers uh, of the reactor tank, and then look at the dimensions. We need a lens, diameter, more thickness. And finally, when we want to calculate the lens, we need the volume and the aspect ratio. So volume comes from the flow rate, which comes from upstream, and the, the vol and the, it also depends on the retention time, which is a decision variable. And that aspect ratio is also another decision variable. So this is just uh, examples of the design algorithms. And next, we move on to the process algorithms. So these are all set of equations, but it will give you the mass and, and the energy flows of the system based on your decision uh, variables, as well as the technology and contextual parameters. So for example, um, in one of my early work, um, so I looked into the biomass of different compositions um, to, and the establish a model to predict the yield and the characteristics of the HTL products based on the composition of the biomass. Um, so this is one type of algorithms. And also in another work um, where I looked at the hydrothermal conversion of the polyhydroxybutyrate propylene. Um, so um, I established a kinetic model to predict the yield of propylene based on the concentrations of crotonic acid as well as three hydroxybutyric acid. So these are two models of the PHP. So these are the examples of the 
um, process algorithms. And finally, um, we can move to the last part of the QSD, which is to track the progress of, uh, of our um, systems using the different sustainability indicators. And these indicators can cover different dimensions of sustainability. We can use return on investment or minimum selling price to look at the environment, uh, look at the economic um, performance. And we can look at, use the indicators like global warming, eutrophication or environmental, uh, environmental impacts. And then we use um, microbial or chemical risk or toxicity to look at the health aspects. And finally, we take in the priorities of the stakeholders, satisfaction of the users to look at the social aspects. So this is the process of the QSD. But the next question we will face is we actually need some new tools that are capable of system simulation and the sustainability characterization at the same time. And this cannot be achieved by the old tools because remember, we not want to enumerate this whole space and the traditional tools they are built to only look at one point. So what we do is we just develop new tools for this. And um, um, I'm contributing to one tool called BioSteam um, which is um, for the design of the biorefineries. And also de uh, I'm also developing um, a tool for the um, um, sanitation systems and we call it QSD -SAN. So the three key features of our tools are first, they are integrated platform. So integrated system simulation and sustainability characterization. And uh, because they allow you to um, simulate the system again and again and again within that space, so you can incorporate the uncertainty of the system and have really robust uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. And finally, we want our tools to be really accessible to everyone, to a broad community. Um, so we make our um, tools open source. We publish every, um, every of these codes of these tools on GitHub. Um, and we have really detailed documentation, tutorials to introduce how we can use these tools. Um, so now we have the QSD, uh, QSD methodology and we have the tools. And next, what I will do is to use an example of a biorefinery design to show um, how we can put these two uh, aspects of my research together. Use QSD to guide this development um, of the new technologies. So um, now, um, assuming we are looking at a second generation biorefinery for lactic acid production, so one key part of this biorefinery is the fermentation unit. So in that unit, we convert the sugars to lactic acid, which is a viable chemical. So the three key um, parameters of the fermentation uh, unit um, is firstly titer, so that is the final concentration of lactic acid in the fermenter, and then yield, so that is a fraction of sugar that can be converted to lactic acid. And finally, the productivity, so that is the rate of the lactic acid generation. So the traditional approach here is that we assuming uh, assume a title, um, a title, a yield, a productivity, and we design one system, and you uh, will get the minimum product selling price or MPST of the lactic acid to get one number. Um, but by using QSD and the, the tools we develop, what we can do is look at this whole fermentation space. So you can look at all the yield you want, all the title you want and it will show you the minimum uh, product selling price of lactic acid. So here, this counter plot, um, the yellow um, indicates low numbers of MPSP, which is good. And then the green or uh, the green is um, high numbers for MPSP, which is bad. And these um, white sh uh, shaded areas, so these are the areas of the um, market price of other lactic acid. Um, so if a metabolic engineer wants to look at where, um, where their um, technology, where their stasis are, they can just look at the figure and uh, they will know whether their um, product right now is competitive with market or not. And another thing you may notice from this figure is that we have four different sections and there are some incontinuity between these this different, uh, this different sections, for example, here and here. So this is because in addition to look at all these title and yield, we also look at into different um, system configurations. So any point on this figure is actually an optimized configuration that will give you the lowest minimum product selling price. So that is power of this QSD on our new tools. And here I'm talking um, only showing results for the productivity at our baseline. 
Um, we also conduct, um, stat, uh, conduct simulations, look at the minimum and the maximum productivity based on the literatures. And also our analysis, they are not only limited to this economic side, we can also look at the global warming potentials um, and also the fossil fuel consumptions to Im important indicators um, for the environmental aspects. So this is how this part of my research can come together. Um, and this marks the end of my presentations. Um, and finally, here's my um, definitely not exhaustive acknowledged slides showing the different mentors, colleagues, friends, co friends and uh, collaborators who are uh, who without whom um, my research wouldn't have been possible. And on the top, um, I'm showing the comparison between um, uh, of my the transformation of my hometown Jinan in China. Um, so I think these two pictures just show the power of our environmental engineers. And uh, with that, um, I will stop and um, I think I'm good for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an excellent presentation. Very interesting work that you're doing. Um, and now is the time for questions. Uh, we have one already. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that is Bumku. Thank you, Kim. Yes, you can call me BK. <laughs> Hi, BK. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, my name is BK. Yeah, I'm the PhD candidate at the University of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And I have a, it is very interesting case, uh, presentation. I have a question about your experimental things. So mm -hmm. in your experimental result, you show that algae can reduce the BOD, right? Uh, algae can- but Normally, so uh, algae reduce the BOD, right? Oh, BOD yes. and nutrient and- you, algae is autotrope, like what possible mechanism algae can reduce like BOD because usually algae bloom cause the BOD increase. That's the problem always, but what kind of mechanism can reduce the BOD from algae? So that's it. Yeah. So yeah, so that is a, a good question. So actually we use a different, we use different kind of algae um, for different mm -hmm. types of wastewater. So for that primary wastewater where our target um, is to reduce B, uh, BOD, we are not actually using the phototrophic species of algae. So what we use is a mixture trophic. This means like, um, so on the, um, so in the more, like a, when there's sunlight, it will pick up the sunlight and produce like a, and produce the um, cellular compounds. But at, at night when there's no sunlight, so the species can actually um, take up this BOD uh, from wastewater and convert that. But for the secondary treatment where like our main goal is not to take up the organics, but rather to take out mm -hmm. those nutrients, we use the phototrophic species. Um, and I remember one joke from our collaborators like who like runs those pilot cell systems. He jokes like this, like make sure trophic mm -hmm. algae just like a graduate student working day and night, pick up those contaminants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think that we have time. It's already 12.30, so one more question. Um, but I see three hands up, so maybe we can continue the discussion definitely later after the second presentation, but um, I don't know who was first, if Lou or Musa. It was, it was Lou, it's in the order on the screen. Okay, so, so I didn't know it was alphabetical. <laughs> uh, so Lou, can you please uh, unmute yourself and yes. then we'll continue the discussion, thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I'm curious about how you uh, consider the impact of climate change in your sustainability analysis. So you mentioned the 100 year uh, global warming potential. So I'm trying to um, understand what, what kind of uh, parameters are you thinking? Like, are you thinking about CO2 or like temperature rise? So yeah, could you explain a bit more on that? Um, so for the sustainability, characteriz uh, sustainability characterization um, is we use the characterization uh, factors we get from the, um, the database, for example, um, if we were to look at the global warming potentials, that is um, um, impact assessment uh, method from the TRACI. Um, so we use the characterization factors associated with that to calculate the, um, the global warming potential. Um, so if we want to look at something such as the um, uh, the eutrophication or other aspects of the sustainability will use the um, characterization factors associated with that matrix. So that it just depends on uh, what type of the impact assessment method you are interested in, and we will use the characterization factors we, um, we get from the database. 
characterize that. So the importance of the system simulation is to generate the inventory so that we can process it through the um, sustainable, sustainable, sustainability characterization to get that value of the indicator. Okay. Lou, do you want to introduce yourself? We know you, but go ahead. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, my name is Lulio. I actually gave the presentation last time here at this platform. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so um, uh, I'm a, I was a postdoc at Rice University working with Dr. Chilin Lee, and now I'm a research associate at Houston Advanced Research Center. Uh, my interest is in uh, water energy climate nexus and um, urban water sustainability. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think you have several questions in the chat, so you're going to be very busy, but it's time to move to the next speaker. I think that Jeremiah is going to introduce him. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Lucia. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Johnson. I'm faculty at North Carolina State University and a member of the uh, Student Services Committee. And it is uh, my honor today to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Ping Feng Yu. Uh, Dr. Yu is a, an alum of the prestigious Tsinghua University in not only environmental engineering, but also economics. So he completed two majors, uh, so truly interdisciplinary approach. Uh, when he came to the US, he uh, studied under uh, Professor Pedro Alvarez at Rice University, earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Uh, and then continuing on as a postdoctoral research fellow. Uh, truly impressive research um, publication list. Uh, his, his work at Rice includes um, attention to biofilm eradication using phage nanomaterial conjugates, uh, photocatalytic microbial contaminant inactivation, and participation in the, uh, in the very active NSF ERC in nanotechnology enabled water treatment. Uh, so without taking any more of his time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Yu. Hi, uh, thank you, Jim Nurse, for the warm introduction. And uh, uh, so I would like to thank uh, Manish for this uh, invitation. So Manish uh, told me to have an attractive title. So I put the good virus in the title. You know, the, the pandemic teach us a lot of things and uh, for a microbiologist, I think uh, it's important to, to recognize that virus is an important uh, component in the microbial community. And the second, as an environmental engineer, want to say uh, the microbial security is closely related with our public health and uh, of course, economic development. Uh, so yes, um, my, my research is uh, really focusing on water. As you know, clean water can enhance human capacity. The first is uh, public health. Uh, these two figures remind us that clean water can actually save more lives than good doctors. As you can see, the last century, uh, the advance in disinfection technology has increased American water life expectancies by around 30 years. And then this is the significant redu reduction in the infant mortality. And of course, clean water is closely related with the food security, energy production, as well as economic development. But we are unfortunately far away from winning this war. As you can see here, uh, in both affluent countries and uh, developing countries, there are Water scarcity is still a major problem, and uh, half of the hospital beds is actually occupied with people related with waterborne diseases, and this number is even higher in developing countries. So, among all the water contaminants, microbial contaminants is really a pain because they are sometimes self-replicating. And uh, the microbial community is kind of like the human community. They were sometimes collaborating and then build a castle to defend the antimicrobial agents. So today, my topic will focus on biofilm. The biofilm is actually an attached microbial aggregate within their self-produced extracellular polymer substrates. 
Sometimes you can feel the sticky stuff in your sink. Yes, that is one type of biofilm. But actually biofilm exists in all the steps of water treatment and uh, reuse and distribution systems. As you can see here, the biofouring can be the aqueous hue of membrane-based water treatment technology. And the biofilm will protect the pathogens, including pathogenic bacteria and pathogenic virus in our drinking water system. The biofilm will also accelerate the corrosion, and this corrosion will cost 1% of American GDP every year. And also, biofilm is just like a hotel for the bacteria. It will develop the bacteria resistance. They will communicate the resistant genes with each other within biofilm. So in facing the emergent and the complexity of uh, microbial problems, novel technology are needed. Then here comes my question. Can we engineer a biofilm? to selectively remove the biofilm dwelling pathogens or to control the problem biofilm to an extent we can accept. At the same time, this method should not produce harmful byproducts as well as the damage to the infrastructure. And then here comes my research. My research focusing on bacterial virus or phage. Bacterial phage has co-evolved and coexist with bacteria for billions of years, which means they have evolved a very specific and efficient way to recognize and infect bacteria. And they are so abundant. If you take one drop of water in the natural environment, it can go to billions of bacterial phages. And uh, the phages have a versatile life cycle. They can use the host, lyses the host, and then produce more offsprings, or they will coexist with the bacteria and replicate with the host. So using this uh, lytic phage life cycle, people have developed a lot of uh, antimicrobial strategies in both medical, food, and of course, water treatment areas. And then the research trend in phage has goes exponentially, as you can see from this figure. And as a green antimicrobial agents, the use of phages has been approved by EPA, FDA, and now there are more and more case, successful cases of phage-based multi-drug resistant uh, bacteria control in hospitals. So my research is more focusing on how can we enhance the phage-based technology or more specifically use phage for biofilm engineering. And here I will give you two cases. One, we use a phage hatch hunting strategy to enhance phage infection of biofilm dewaring pathogenic bacteria. And the second case is we use a combination of nanotechnology and the phage biotechnology to more efficiently remove biofilm. So the first experiment here show you in a flow system, when we increase the flow rate or reduce the hydraulic retention time, when the hydraulic retention time is reduced, then the particles will have less chance to reach the bottom, which in this case, the phage will have a less chance to reach the biofilm. And then the phage production rate will reduce. But if we introduce a uh, flagellated bacteria, which is the Bacillus in this case. This bacteria is motile with its flagella. So they can move to a more favorable environment 
or they can move to escape a harsh environment. The phage can be attached by B series, but it will only specifically infect E. coli. As you can see here in this agar, if we put the bacteria and the phage together, the bacteria will form a large colony compared with the carrier bacteria alone. And then the phage lysis zone is also enhanced. It seems there is a mutualism between this carrier bacteria and the hatch hacking phage. And then when we put both the phage and the carrier in this flow system, you can see even at a low hydraulic detention time, the phage infection can still be enhanced and this enhancement is because of uh, the phage was attached on the fragile of the bacteria. And interestingly, if you take a close look at the phage bonding pattern, the phage use its capsid attached on the fragile of the carrier bacteria. And then the phage tail fibers, which is responsible for host recognition and uh, infection is facing outside. And the second interesting site is the affinity of the phage to the carrier bacteria is uh, much lower than its affinity to the host bacteria. It reminds us the phage is taking this carrier bacteria and then when it recognizes or reach the site of the host bacteria, it will just very feasibly to infect the host. And since the fragile is important for this uh, carrying or adsorption process, when we use enzyme to treat the fragile, the fragile is damaged, and then the consistent phage infection is inhibited. Let's take a look at the biofilm. So we use a confocal microscope to see when before and after the phage present, the carrier bacteria will exhibit different colonization efficiency. Without the phage, the colonization is really low, less than 10% in two days. But when we introduce the phage, then because of the cell lysis and then the reduced interspecies competition, more foreign bacteria can colonize on this uh, new biofilm. And then let's take the results from another perspective, focusing on the problematic bacteria E. coli here. With a free phage treatment, there's almost no impact on the E. coli biofilm. But with this high hiking phage, the, bio, the E. coli in the biofilm is significantly reduced. Okay, here comes our second part. As we know, most of biofilm are mixed species ones, which means the problematic bacteria may be protected by the existence of resistant host. And then our hypothesis here is, can we get some phage with broad host length? So see, we can use multiple hosts to replicate and then reach the problematic bacteria in the deep side of the biofilm. Then how can we get this broad, broad host length phages? The way is actually to introduce more hosts. So here gives you a quick overview of our multiple host isolation process. By introduce the phage to host one, and then the phage, the magnetized host will specifically trap phages infecting host one. And then we can use a magnetic field to collect the host as well as the phages. And then once this phage, new phage offspring 
are produced, they will be introduced to the second host. This is like a high throughput isolation chain can help us to get phage of broad host length. And this is an example of a phage PF1 can infect both E. coli and Pseudomonas. E. coli and Pseudomonas, they are from different orders. Uh, compared with the specific colophage T4 here, so T4 is uh, more like a specialist on E. coli. So it will have higher damage on the E. coli host. But although polyvalent phage has a weaker effect on E. coli, it can use other hosts to replicate. And then if we put them in a multiple host system, the PF1 polyvalent phage can use multiple hosts to replicate. They will be maintained in a higher level. And this is beneficial for phage diffusion into the biofilm. And then the, if we take a look at the E. coli abundance on the sand surface, which are the biofilm shown here, so introducing the polyvalent phage will disrupt the biofilm to a large extent and accordingly inhibit the E. coli growth to a great extent. So um, here, let's go to our next story is how can we combine nanotechnology and phage-based biotechnology for more efficient biofilm irrigation because Biofouring is like a arcus heel for membrane-based technology, and then new technology are needed for biofilm irrigation. And when we go through the conventional biofilm removal strategy, they are kind of following a from top to bottom pattern, which means that the phage or other antimicrobial agents, they needed to treat the biofilm from the top layer to the bottom layer. And then we ask ourselves, can we use the nanotechnology to deliver the phages directly to the bottom of the biofilm? And then if the bottom layer is damaged by the phage, and then the biofilm will be easier to remove. So here is our study. First, we investigate how the effect of uh, nanocarrier surface affects the efficiency of phage. As you can see here, if we put a surface aminization versus uh, carboxylic groups, the amine groups will significantly influence the phage infection efficiency. And uh, this is because uh, during the long-term evolution, the phage has evolved their phage tails with a slightly positive charge to more efficiently recognize the negative charge of the host surface. And when we modify the particle surface with amine groups, we are actually optimize this phage orientation to facilitate their recognition and uh, infection of the host. But if we functionize the particle surface with carboxylic group, we are actually impeding this uh, infection process. Another interesting point is, so phage is a self-replicating antimicrobial agent. If we increase the loading of a phage on each particle to some extent, it will increase the probability of a successful infection and then later successful biofilm removal. But if the loading number is exceed a certain threshold, the efficiency will be stopped because one particle will only form one center of infection. More phage loading is not helpful for the infection and the biofilm removal. And this SEM image shows you the phage loaded nanoparticles are attaching on the bacterial surface. And here, the red arrow shows the lysis of bacteria within biofilm. 
Then second, we investigate how the size of the nanocarrier impacts the biofilm removal. Then we synthesize the three sized particles here, uh, short as S, M, and uh, L. As you can see, a larger particle will, of course, load more phages. But the large particle will also cause more static hindrance between the particles. So actually, the efficiency of phage loading per unit area is higher for small particles. And on the other side, uh, large phages, they will cause more static hindrance, so they will load less on each size of particles. And the, the interesting here is, first, when we introduce phage into the biofilm with the help of the carrier, the efficiency of biofilm removal is significantly higher than free phages. And uh, since the uh, phage infection is responsible for this biofilm removal, you can see small particles actually works better than the large particles. And here are two possible mechanisms. For the large particles, we designed this fidget biofilm diffusion assay. As you can see here, large particles will cause more physical disruption to the biofilm. And then the phages are easy to diffuse vertically. On the other side, when the small conjugates are introduced, they will form more center of infection. So this is the bottom of the biofilm after the two hour treatment. You can see the bottom of biofilm is disrupt more significant compared to either the free phage treatment group or the large phage treatment group, which means the small conjugates, they are better at cleaning the bottom of the biofilm. Uh, here is a semi ampere model to recap the process. As you can see here, free phages, they affect the biofilm from the outside layer to inside, which is really low efficient. But if we introduce the phages by magnetic nanoparticles, they will infect the biofilm from the bottom. And the larger ones, because of the physical disruption, they were more easier to diffusion vertically. And then these uh, small particles, because of its uh, high number of center of infection, it will more easier to clean the biofilm bottom layer. Uh, to summarize, hitchhiking strategy can be adopted to expand the scope and improve the efficiency of phage-based biofilm engineering. Uh, broad host range is helpful for phage to replicate and to control the mixed species biofilm. And third, uh, nanotechnology holds promise to facilitate phage-based biofilm removal. To, uh, in my future work. So actually now we are mainly focusing on this lytic cycle. And uh, the phage can actually be really versatile and then the potential of this uh, lysogenic cycle and then the conversion of between these two cycles is understudied. So my future research will more focusing on the lysogenic cycle and then by combining phage-based technology with nanotechnology for more efficient biofilm engineering. And the second, as an environmental scientist, um, I'm also curious about how environmental stress will influence the bacteriophage interaction and how this interaction will in further influence biofilm pathogenesis and resistance.
my potential founding community include NSF, USDA, and NIH. And uh, here I would end my presentation and I would like to thank everyone for supporting my research. Thank you. And I'm open to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. Very nice presentation. Uh, I think the, the first question, oh, we've got a whole bunch. Let me see. The, the first one, Manish, I think you had your hand up first. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Manish Kumar, uh, University of Texas at Austin, uh, associate professor. I, my question to you, um, Ting Feng, was this simulated, the simulation you did? What is that simulation and how do you do it? Uh, uh, you can show you. that slide. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. So that actually, um, there are already established method for phage diffusion and replication in the biofilm settings. And then uh, our method is to modify some parameters. The first is uh, because of these uh, physical channels. So the uh, phage diffusion of migration in the vertical will be enhanced. And then their decay will be reduced. So this is the base of this uh, uh, model. And then we use the, uh, the biofilm removal rate and then the phage, ultimate phage number to calibrate the model. And then uh, the finally you can you can see this pattern. Like a... Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, BK, do you have a question? Oh yeah. Hello, uh, my name is BK, a PhD candidate at Universal, Dr. Dan. So, I have a question about your uh, like phase strategy to remove the biofilm. So based on your research to remove the harmful biofilm, you inject the engineered phase, right? Do you think, is it safe to inject the engineered phase in the like water environment or ecosystem? Is it safe to inject those type of phase? Um, is there any, any harmful effect? By that, great question. So, uh, uh, I here I, I use a safe nanoparticle and uh, this uh, for the uh, loading, and then uh, the surface modification is actually uh, very common used for uh, nanomaterial design. Uh, but I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, further bio safety or eco toxicity research is needed to. Uh, elucidate their long-term impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, also, these are isolated phages, right? They're not yeah. engineered phages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are oh, okay. uh, natural phages, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Wen, Wen Ma, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay, hello, Dr. Yu. Uh, this is Wen Ma from Yale University, and I'm a postdoc. Thanks for your presentation. I really like your figures. It's very organized. And I will ask uh, for the nanocarriers and the interaction between nanocarriers and bacteria phage. Uh, first question is um, whether the nanocarrier has, uh, is toxic for the phage and also for the orientation control. Uh, how is the stability for the, uh, between the bonding of uh, phage and the nanoparticle? And also whether the orientation control is uh, Precise and easy. It's an easy uh, operation, or it's very difficult. And how, how precise it is. Thanks. Uh, thank you. This is an excellent question. So, um, uh, so in the first question is uh, how we conjugate. So we, we test both physical adsorption and uh, um, covalent bonding, and we find the covalent bonding is more stable compared with the physical adsorption. And then uh, also because of this is a covalent bonding. So uh, the orientation of the phage, uh, based on my understanding, it, it, it should be enhanced. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, like a, a visual proof to, to confirm it. That's the pity of uh, my previous research. Uh, thanks. And also another question is whether the nanoparticle has um, is toxic to the fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we 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 do the uh, like uh, co-culture experiment. Um, the actually, 
the toxic of uh, iron-based uh, nanoparticle is very limited. If you use a um, silver-based uh, nanoparticle, yes, it's significant. But for the iron ones, uh, I think the impact of the orientation is more significant. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. Thank you for your question. Great. And I think with that question, we will end the formal Q&A. And so if you could join me in, in giving Dr. Yu a, a, a virtual round of applause, please. Uh, we will keep the, the, um, the Zoom open. Uh, and so if you have any follow-up questions for, for either of our presenters, uh, or if you would just like to discuss the, the, the broader program that the Student Services Committee is offering, um, stick around. And so we'll, we'll keep this open for another uh, 10 or so minutes. And thank you uh, to both of our presenters, two excellent presentations today.